Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers, and again, I'm flying solo as we do a special series of podcasts we're calling the Protecting Minds series. This is a reflection of our campaign that's currently being launched this fall in partnership between Ontario Shores Center for Mental Health Sciences and the Ontario Shores Foundation. Uh, you can visit protectingminds.ca to learn more about uh, the, the campaign, different initiatives at Ontario Shores and how we're trying to help people impacted by mental illness. And this year, like previous campaigns, but this year we've connected with a new group of, of individuals whose lives have been impacted uh, to some degree uh, by mental illness. And this year we reached out and did a call on social media and uh, just to see who's interested in helping us in this conversation, uh, interested in advocacy, interested in seeing change, whether it be in the stigma or the, the system, and we were blown away by um, the response that we received. And we have 10 individuals who have agreed to share their story and, and talk about how mental illness has impacted their lives in hopes of helping others. And we are pleased to have one of those participants with us today. Um, I'd like to welcome Lori Snyder. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate um your time today and your uh, participation in the campaign. So why don't, you know, for people that don't know, uh, tell us a little bit about how your life has been impacted by mental illness. Okay, so I lost my son to suicide in May of 2019. It was after a brief battle with um, mental illness. In January 2018, he started struggling uh, with anxiety. He thought he was having a heart attack the day he called me and went to the doctors. Um, interestingly enough, after he realized that it was mental health, he didn't want to go to the doctors for a long time after that. So it was inter one of those interesting things to me that people are okay to go if they think they're having a heart attack, but not okay once they realize it has something to do with mental health. So in July of 2018, him and his wife and children lost their home to a fire. And we, we definitely seen things spiral then. We, um, they were saying PTSD. They said bipolar at one time. There was a few different diagnoses he was given later on because, once again, first he wasn't willing to admit or see that he had any of these, you know, that he wasn't sleeping and that there would be days he then couldn't get out of bed. But then there was days he was on this high and, was larger than life, it, it seemed like, and um, could change his mind in an instant. And um, he, he, he never did agree to go. He um, got into a vehicle accident um, due to freezing rain, and I think many days of no sleep. And uh, he ended up at the hospital, and it was a, they uh, had to pick glass out of his legs and feet for quite a few hours, and he'd have to go to x-ray and come back. And it was that night that we finally, um, I just said, I think it's, it's time that we, you know, we talk about what else is going on. Um, and he was a little while getting um, into counseling, a little while getting into uh, see a psychiatrist. Very difficult time going though. Um, just, and we were seeing more hopelessness and, and frustration and feeling like he was a burden and all those things that, that go with it. And um the trial runs of the different medications, you know, knowing that there's many to try and, um, but we just kept seeing more and more frustration. And then, you know, and then on that day, then he, he, uh, he took his life on May 15th. Obviously I, I know that was, you know, didn't necessarily happen yesterday, but it's, it must feel like yesterday. So my condolences on your, on your loss. Um, when you were, when you were just beginning that, kind of summary of your son's journey, you know, the, you, you hit on her. The first thing that I thought of was, of course, you're going to go to the doctor when you have a heart problem. And 
and then just to see the reaction when uh, or how people's perspectives change um, when they discover that it's something to do with their brain and not their their heart. Um, I'm guessing that that was a big driver in how you've you know kind of lived your life following the death of your son is trying to change that perception. Yeah, it was it was a huge eye opener for us. Um, you know, to see someone go from, you know, being hardworking. I mean, he, I don't know, cut and split firewood from a young age to working at the marina to like, he loved working. He loved his family. He loved life. He was a jokester. He, you know, so to see how it can happen to anyone, right? There's this perception that the stigma even behind that part of it. So it was, you know, in myself, I talked to my children about everything growing up. I never talked to them about mental health. I never talked to them about, you know, what to do if that happens someday. Like there's so many values I wanted to teach them and so many, you know, great things. But looking back now, it's not something as a family we ever discussed. And, and so that's one of the things, you know, that I was like, you know, wished, um, you know, wished we had done and definitely recommend people do. But, um, and seeing the stigma. And you know, he even said to me one day on one of his better days, he said, mom, I'm, I'm one of those people. I, I was part of that, making the stigma happen. I've made comments, I've done things, I've said things I shouldn't have. Like, you know, so I think so many times, many of us, you know, use words. I still sometimes use a word and I catch myself and think, oh, I could put that better. So that's definitely what started Baseball for Dad. It was, it was literally a 3 a.m. idea. We originally started writing Mark's story in hopes to help someone. Um, so somebody else maybe would relate to it or another family. And then a few months in, then um, it was just a 3 a.m. idea of like he loved baseball. And, you know, what if we start placing ball gloves all over the world? And we decided as a family we would do one a month. And um, we would put a card with it. So when somebody finds it, you know, they, there was instructions to go to social media. And so as we post them and as people find them, it would get people talking and, and people have shared stories, personal stories, and, and it's just creating that awareness. And then on that same social media sites, then we, we put information, awareness, things we do, like challenges, we do um, draws, all kinds of things to get people to share, share awareness. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, the idea behind baseball for dad is, you know, you, you come up on a bench and there's a ball glove and curiosity takes over. You read the note and, and you connect that way. Uh, what are some of the stories that you've heard from people that have reached out who have found one of your gloves? But, so it's, I mean, there's been so many amazing stories. There is literally one person and they asked us not to share like, like his name and stuff on social media, but um, he, told me he called his mom to go get help that day when he found the glove. Like that was his sign that he needed help. So that was probably, you know, the one that impacted me most, but there's so many, like the, our, as a family last year, we put one at Canada's Wonderland and there was a, um, a soldier there with his family that day who was struggling severely with PTSD. It was all he could do to be there that day with his family. And he said, when he found the glove, glove, he just felt like there was hope. And, um, yeah, and so he wrote us and thanked us. But, yeah, it's just we've um, – one ball glove was found by a family that was literally putting a tournament on that morning for their son that they lost from suicide, son, brother, nephew. And they were all there and found that glove on the uh, home plate when they arrived that morning to set up. So there's been so many um, – so many uh, – Ashlyn Jolliker, the young girl, baseball player in Whitby that found a glove, like she has – been amazing and she's been putting gloves all over the place so that's the other thing i should say like right now we would only have 13 gloves out doing one a month but so many people got involved we literally have 150 gloves in 14 different countries now <laughs> it's just in one year or in 13 months the the program i mean it's obviously doing what you'd hoped i would think like it's starting conversations it's making people uh, think about their own situation reach out for help it's but what has it meant to your own personal recovery? Because, you know, losing a child, you know, mental health issues, like, you know, might have been your son's struggle, but you were, you know, likely impacted your mental health before uh, you lost them and certainly after. So what has it, you know, what has that meant to you and your family being yeah. able to have that Do kind of outlet? Yeah, it's actually been a great healing process. 
And so I know I've had a few people say, you know, is this too much for you? But it's not getting to share a story, getting to share Mark, like getting to share the, the amazing man and dad he was, right? Like he was that dad who who woke the kids up at midnight to open their Christmas presents because he couldn't wait. You know, he's the one that painted the little girl's nails. He was, you know, so getting to share the, you know, who he was and everything we do has a bit of him. Like, you know, the ball gloves are made in his favorite or the uh, cards are made in his favorite color. Um, you know, it's do with baseball, even the benches we've made in his color. He was an outdoorsman. So we have wildlife on the sides of the bench, even though baseball, in the back story and that's jumping ahead to the benches but it's just um it has been amazing for us to um to go places to be part of things and to get to share him um and we're doing it together so i mean and through covid that's even yeah that, you know that, that puts that struggle on it but um yeah it's really it's nice to to share with him and it's nice to feel like you're making change um you know so I guess putting our pain into something positive you know, just in hopes that we can help. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, like just listening to you, your story, you think about like he was a young man, right? If he had, uh, and you live in a rough, you know, live in a small community too, right? If yeah. he was, if he had died of a physical condition, you know, somebody would have started a ball tournament in, in his memory or somebody like the community would have reached out uh, and I'm not sure if they have or not, but that's what we do, right? When people have died tragically or, or young uh, in our society's history, we, we name ball fields or we start events or we do something to keep their memory alive. But for the most part, people who succumb to suicide after struggling with their mental illness, they like the, it's almost like in the past, it's almost as though they never lived, but this is a way for, for you to keep his memory alive. Absolutely. And you know, we've gotten emails from families about that. Felt like I could never talk about a dad, could never talk about a brother, could never, you know, and felt like they had to be ashamed of how they passed away. And I was like, you know, absolutely not. I watched him struggle. I watched him fight the fight of his life. I mean, obviously I wish, you know, he would have got the proper medication and, and would have gotten help sooner. And, um, you know, and there wasn't the stigma part to it and all those things that happened. Obviously, I wish, you know, he was here today and, and I wasn't doing this. But, um, but, you know, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I mean, if, you know, I guess if anybody has watched anybody go through illness, like they fight hard. They get up every day and fight harder for everyday things than any of us ever have to. With no empathy from community, right? Yeah. Like, Cause you know, yeah. like wh whether it's cancer or, you know, name the critical illness, uh, there's a great deal of empathy when, you know, especially the more sick you get, the more empathy uh, is, is evident. But when it comes to mental illness, the, the sicker you get, the more people back away from you. Yeah. Mm. And I keep saying to people, it's okay not to be okay. Like it's literally, that's the one thing for Mark, like, would keep saying like why am i like this why is this happening why is and you know and it would be take one step at a time it's okay not to be okay but he really struggled with that piece of it right and and yeah so hoping to teach that young we've definitely been doing some stuff in the schools and and awareness things and kindness things to really get that message out to people so it's still you know you're still dealing with you know lots of your son still very fresh uh, participating in this campaign is going to, you know, open it up a, a little bit more, right, in terms of you know, his story and and people's knowledge of it, and and you're likely to see it on your Facebook feed, participating in the campaign or, or other places. Um, what made you decide to reach out when you saw that we were looking for people to share their story? Well, I actually had somebody reach out to me and told me that I I need to share my story they they sent it to me um so that's how that um that started but you know what i've heard a lot of great feedback about ontario shores and i have a list of phone numbers and stuff when i have families call me and that is one of the phone numbers you know i give when i hear that people are desperate and but i've had heard a lot of great recovery stories and healing stories and and um so yeah that was the reasoning of helping right because i can end this 
I can try and help end the stigma and create awareness. But bottom line is there's always those people that still need help, you know, beyond that, or, you know, the everyday help is not there. And, you know, everything I've heard is, you know, that Ontario Shores is the place to be. And just, it just made me think of, you know, a question you asked me via email this week about resources in the community. And I know, uh, depending on where you live, uh, that can be a real challenge. I don't know if people really understand that, right? When you're living in, a, in an urban area or like, de or depending on the community, even uh, communities aren't created equal. And uh, sometimes it can be really tough to, to get resources. And I know you're doing some some work to try and, and help that, but maybe just speak about what kind of challenge that is. Yeah, so we're we're definitely in a in a small community with not a lot of resources, and and we're definitely um, you know we're seeing more mental health. We're seeing, I mean, probably COVID isn't helping, but we're we're seeing more addictions, more homelessness. Um, you know, and I mean, it's my personal opinion, but I just really see how they all tie into one another. Um, watching Mark struggle. You know, he, he never, never was a drinker and never, um, never tried drugs until probably a month or two before he passed, you know, anything to make the pain to go away. A couple of times we found him with an empty bottle and a couple of times he, you know, he said he tried drugs. So I can easily see how that would, if it did make you feel better, how you could end up in that situation. You know, I talked to so many families that, you know, have had to unfortunately put children out on the street because the situation at home has got, gotten so bad. And than the struggle they're dealing with. So I'm just, I'm hearing from so many families that need groups to talk to one another. I'm hearing from people who have had loss that would love to have a group to talk together. Um, and then, you know, to have a place that even is just free of judgment that somebody can walk in and have a coffee and tea and, um, uh, you know, feel like they can talk or they can ask, where do I get the help or where do I go from here or um, what steps can I take? So that's what I would like to see someday, definitely. Just um, a spot maybe even to fill in the gaps because we just, we have a lot of gaps in a small area. And I have reached out to places like Belleville and such, and they have offered gas cards and that sort of thing. It's still just, you know, getting people, we're still talking right an hour, an hour and a half mm -hmm. to those bigger cities. Yeah, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be quite a few community people willing to make the changes because there's been such an increase and and concern so i'm hoping to see some positive things happen well the work you're doing is very commendable and and needed um hopefully the campaign participating in the campaign will help you know um, not only our objectives in terms of expanding programming and, and support for people with mental illness but also um your program uh, in memory of your son, which I was going to ask if people want to learn more about what you're doing with baseball for dad, uh, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah. So they can um, email me at Lori, L O U R I at baseball for dad.com or there's baseball for dad on Facebook and Instagram and there's a baseball for dad.com website. So at any of those areas, you can find, find information to get in touch with me. Right. Well, thank you. We'll certainly pass that along. Thanks for participating in the campaign and thanks for taking time with us uh, right now. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a great experience.